preached a sermon, I don't know, a couple years ago, and the parts of the same sermon 10 years ago on how to know the will of God. And I have that sermon. It's a very, I feel like it's an important message. And, um, but I will, this is something completely different. And, but I'm going to hit it from this angle. Ways, there's ways to know God's will for your life. Ways to know God's will for your life. It's different than that other one. This is completely all different material and different points and everything. I might do the other one again sometime. I'm sure I will. But anyway, look here in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's what you're supposed to do with your body. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The will of God has been the subject of thousands of conversations, books, tracts, counseling, sermons, advice, advice from advisors, and uh, the will of God is something that seems elusive. What is that? that's, that's like trying to catch a fish with your bare hand, right? When you think you got it, it squirts out and goes the other way, and you, it seems like it's a hard thing to really just lay your hands on sometime. And so people ask me all the time, how do I know that what's God's will? When, when you're gonna marry somebody or when you're going to college or when you're gonna buy a house or when you're gonna uh, do anything really, them big decisions, but even little day to day, where am I gonna work? Uh, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna live in a certain way? How do I know what God's will? You only get one life and believe me, it goes by faster than you realize. Now, I've preached that all my life, but the older I get, the more I realize. Buddy, you look back and you say, good night, where has time gone? And I'm telling you, it flies, people. So uh, uh, you don't get but one chance to do the will of God for your life. What is it and how, how would you know it? Here is some practical advice, and there are exceptions. Here, remember me saying that. Here is some practical advice, and there are exceptions. Remember that. Uh, to knowing the will of God for your life. Uh, many people think the will of God is some, it has to be some kind of full-time ministry or calling or uh, maybe a missionary or evangelist or something. No, and that's, not, that's not true at all. Uh, you can do and be in the will of God washing dishes and washing clothes and cooking dinner and being good, faithful to your husband and teaching your kids about the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be right smack dab in the will of God, working at a factory eight hours a day, paying your bills, raising your family, and leading them to the Lord, right in the middle of it. You do not have to do something outstanding, earth-impacting life to be in the will of God. Uh, that's just, that's rare. So tonight, I wanna give you five things, and I'll just name them off quickly. This is in the form of like a, maybe a little teaching, preaching. So number one, here's what I'd like for you to look at. If you wanna know if you're in the will of God for your life, number one, look at your surrender. Look at your surrender. The first step to anybody being in the will of God is absolute 100% surrender to God himself. The Bible said that we're uh, to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Just like they brought them Old Testament sacrifices in there and they killed them and let the blood go on the altar. That's what our body's supposed to be in the New Testament. Our body's a living sacrifice right here. That means I don't hold back. That means I say, Lord, here I am, whatever, however you wanna do. Now, until you get to that point, you're never gonna know if you're in God's will. As a matter of fact, uh, sin will keep you not only from uh, knowing God's will, it'll keep you from doing God's will. If you're not surrendered, it will keep you from doing the will of God. Let me give you an example. Uh, this happens all the time. I've done it myself. 
You have to. You come to the altar on Sunday, we have a wave coming through, you know, and people get blessed and people crying and hugging necks and getting right with each other. And boy, you just feel so good. And you say, man, I'm going to read my Bible this week. I'm going on visitation Saturday. I'm going to knock on doors this week. I'm going to get, I'm going to, we all, we all get like that once in a while. And then by Saturday, uh, but when Saturday comes from it, you, you're nowhere to be found. You don't even have no interest in it. Now, what happened is you watch TV Monday night and TV Tuesday night and, and read junk Thursday, Wednesday night and didn't do anything spiritual, and that sin kept you from doing the will of God. Now, if you'll be honest with me tonight, all of us have done that. I sure have. Hadn't you? Hadn't you made up your mind, buddy, I'm, I'm gonna do this or I'm gonna do that? And then the devil uses something or somebody or something to keep you from doing that. So you gotta look at your surrender. I would not trust myself. I was talking to a young man recently who's uh, haven't had marriage problems, uh, not here in our church. Uh, I was talking to a young man has been to our church, of course, but I said, now look, uh, are, are you doing the will of God? He said, well, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and he's, he's done, got himself involved with a woman and, and they're dating and all of that, you know, and he said something to the effect, effect that I believe God sent her to me or somehow or some other like that. And you know what I told him? I said, listen, you, you're, not even, you're not even living right. I would not trust my own feelings as to what God's will is. Listen, I, listen well, I'm doing the best I can sometimes and I wonder whether or not I'm doing God's will all the time. If you're sinning, there ain't no way the will of God's gonna be plain in your life. And I'm telling you, if you're living backslid, you will not make the right decisions. You'll get yourself in a bigger mess. You'll, you'll never, you'll never, you're not gonna say, well, I'm going through marriage trouble, so I'm just gonna go with my friends to the beach and, and we're gonna go to the club and we're gonna drink. And I'm just gonna, I just need some time away from church. That's about the dumbest thing you could possibly say. I mean, brother, when you're having problems, you need to be in church more than ever. I mean, when you're, you need the Lord more than ever before. Uh, people get all fired up and say they're gonna do this and that and then don't do it. You will never get to, you will never find the will of God living in sin. Jonah did not get the will of God till he repented in that fish and got and went. Peter did not get in the will of God until he went out and wept bitterly and got in God's will. Uh, 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 Moses did not get in the will of God till he went out there and got things straight. Uh, Jonah did not get in the will of God. The prodigal son did not get in the will of God until he came to himself and went back to the father and made things right. The very first thing you gotta do is get your heart completely surrendered. Now I'm telling you, it don't matter what you think or who tells you what, you have gotta start at the bottom. If you're gonna build this building here tonight, you know what you do? You dig a foundation all the way around there about that deep and fill it full of concrete and get the foundation right. Nothing is right until the foundation and no other man can lay that but the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm telling you tonight, if, if, I'm got a, if I've got major decisions to make, I'm not gonna trust myself if I'm doing something wrong. You better make sure you're totally surrendered. Number two, the second thing you better look at is the need. Uh, one way you can know the will of God for at least present tense is look at the need. Example, if I'm sitting here tonight and uh, Jeremy and Jim and the toes here and I'm sitting here like this and they say, hey, we need to fit, put something in that pulpit and they're over there trying to pick that pulpit up. That thing's solid cherry wood. That thing ain't no telling what it weighs. And uh, they, they, they get to pick that up and they're struggling and they can't get it up, I don't really have to pray about if it's the will of God that I help them. Look at the need. Amen. Does that make sense? Amen. Look at the need. I mean, if there's a need, it's obviously the will of God I'm sitting here. I could be sitting in China, but I'm not. He got me sitting right there, so look at the need right in front of your face. I think we got a lot of people saying, well, I'm gonna serve the Lord out yonder somewhere. My long-range plans are to be a missionary in, 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 in Ukraine or somewhere in Europe or somewhere. I tell you what you better do. You better look at what's right in front of you right now today and do that and do the will of God. I'm telling you, look at the need. Look at the need. If I've got 
$100 in my pocket and somebody here uh, don't have anything and they're trying to get up there to the next exit and, and get them a hamburger, I think I don't have to say, well, uh, Lord, if, if it's your will, uh, the need would be if I can, I'm gonna help financially. If I can, I'm gonna help physically. If I, I mean, uh, I, I was talking to Brother right over this morning about painting. I said, can you paint? And he said, yeah. Now, if you can paint, uh, it, it look around, something needs painting. We got a lot of stuff back there. The hallway, uh, around them restroom door, that stuff gets dirty, man. It's got 10,000 hands a Sunday on it. Just rubbing, I don't know why, every kid rubs the wall. Uh, but uh, I mean, it just gets dirty. And it, you don't have to say, well, it might be the will of God uh, that I could paint. Uh, it, 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 look at the need. If there's a need, if there's a need, if there's empty places in the choir, uh, you say, it might be the will of God that I help. If there's, uh, if there's somebody that needs encouragement, it might be the will of God. Just look at the need. You don't have to pray. I mean, look at the, the, the bus workers and, uh, and all the stuff that goes on in the bus ministry. And, uh, what is the will of God? Somebody said this. What is the will of God? Here's the answer true. The nearest thing that should be done that he can do through you. Listen again. What is the will of God? Here's the answer true. The nearest thing that should be done that he can do through you. One more time. What is the will of God? Here's the answer true. The nearest thing that should be done and he can do it through you. The bus workers. The, the bus ministry, lend a helping hand. Yesterday I was here, Jennifer was, was sick with the flu and Miss Sandy's had sickness and Brian was here by himself. I'd planned to do some what I call pastoral visiting. Well, that means uh, visit backsliders up, up, up toward, toward, toward uh, Mar- on the other side of town, uh, toward Marion. And uh, I was gonna do that. And I thought, man, Brian's out here and it's pouring rain. I ain't gonna make him go down there by himself. Uh, there was a need there. So I figured maybe it's the will of God. That I said, Brian, you want me to go with you today? And he said, yes, sir, I'd love, I'd love that. So I went, just stuff like that. When somebody needs something, uh, look at the need. You don't know the will of God, look at the need. Oh, you thought I was gonna get up here and say, God's called some of you to a worldwide singing ministry. God's called some of you to a worldwide teaching ministry. You're gonna be the next somebody on TV uh, that has a vast audience of millions. No, I kind of doubt that. That don't happen too often. But I'll tell you what he'll do. He'll show you something sitting right beside you. And if you're willing to do that, he might give you something a little bit bigger and more important to do. Look at the need, number three. Number three, look at your burden. What are you naturally burdened for? Paul said, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For if Paul had such a burden for his brethren according to the flesh, Israel. If you have a burden to learn Spanish or you have a strange burden to want to learn other languages to teach kids, it probably might be the will of God for you to go that direction. Look at your burden. And I know we all have burdens about everything, everything, but I'm talking about if God gives you a heavy burden that goes in a certain direction, maybe maybe printing, maybe like, like Caitlin, she, she's starting to do some printing, like maybe write a track. I wrote a track one time. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, and uh, I don't even know if I can even find one anymore, but maybe somebody, uh, you're good at stuff like that, you could write a track. You could have them things published. You, the Lord might use you to win thousands of people to him or be a witness to thousands. Whatever, whatever your burden is, whatever your burden is, like uh, to play an instrument or help the choir or help, help uh, the church with them uh, when it gets, the weeds start coming out with the weeds and, and whatever that might be. Maybe foster care, like I mentioned this morning about the foster kids. I, they called me and said there's five kids in Burke County who have nowhere to go right now, five babies. Maybe you, maybe you say, I just can't get that off my mind, preacher. I just can't get that off my mind. I believe the Maybe the Lord might be leading you to do that. I don't know. Uh, whatever your burden is, look at your burden. What do you feel for? Now, I, I feel burden for everything and everybody. I do. I feel burden for everything, all the parts of the whole ministry. But I'm the pastor. I'm supposed to feel like that. But some things I really feel a strong 
burden for. Like that church thing I did a few weeks ago. Like that thing on the Baptist church I did a year ago. Man, I felt like, I, I, Kelly told you, I think I felt like, I felt like I'd give birth after that thing was over with. I felt such a relief. I don't know what that feels like, but it felt like, Paul, I'm glad I got this out. I'm glad I got this over with. I, that was my burden. That was my burden. That was my burden. And by the way, let me say this. If God calls you to be a missionary, if you're called to be a missionary to a foreign country, I tell you what you'll do. You'll witness everybody and their grandma right here in the United States of America. You're not gonna get a missionary. People say, I'm called to be a missionary. I've known people going around raising support and won't even witness, won't even go visit, won't knock on a door and say, I'm called to be a missionary. I doubt that. If your burden is to win souls, uh, you're probably not gonna go to, to Africa or China or Japan until you witness for the Lord here. Some people, now, now some people do this, and, and I do this too. Sometimes every time we have a missionary, every time we have somebody come through and present a burden, you feel like, oh my goodness, I believe the Lord wants me to do that. Now you gotta be careful of that because it ain't God's will for everybody to do that. Look at it like this. If you got, if you got four kids and in debt head over heels, I doubt if it's God's will for you to go to the mission field next week. Just common sense. Now, if he worked a miracle and paid all your bills off and said, hallelujah, I'm not saying God can't do that. I'm not saying God don't call some people in extreme circumstances. He does. But I'm saying as a general rule, as a general rule, I, it, it is probably not God's will for me to teach Greek. I have no interest in Greek. I have no training in Greek. No interest at all. The only thing I would ever be interested in Greek at all for was to validate and back up what I believe about the King James Bible. Other than that, I have no use for it at all. You say, well, preachers ought to have right. Well, if we got the word of God in English, we don't need to. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that ain't my bag, y'all. That ain't my burden. Never has been. I don't. I just don't. I just. I, I don't know. It would. It would. Oh, I die if the Lord called me to do that. And he. I mean, he could. But I have no burden for that whatsoever. It is probably not God's will for us to begin a new auditorium out right here this week. That's probably not God's will. We don't have the space. The dirt ain't gone yet. We don't have the money. We don't have, don't have no plans. We don't have a bed. I mean, it's, it's, sometimes it, it, is, it is probably almost 100% sure that it's not God's will for Marty to get married this week. I mean, there's just something that, duh. I mean, it's plain. And you know what blows my mind? We got Christian people in churches trying to do stuff that it's so obvious they're not called to do it. I mean, you know what I mean? I don't mean to be ugly, but good Lord, people. I, I'll get on that back on that in a minute, but where's your burden? Where's your burden? You say, well, I just love kids. Sunday school, bus ministry, Foster, like I said, they're begging. I had no idea the foster system was so overloaded. There's like 300 and something in Burke County, Crystal. Is that right? Huh? 250 foster kids in Burke County. And this, 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 that's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. And some of them just get shifted from place to place. I talked to one young man. He was in his 20s. He said he'd been in about 15 different foster homes and abused in most of them. And that, that's because some of them just do it because financial benefit or something like that. But I'm telling you, there's a need. You say, well, Brother Danny, I just care about kids. I care about kids. Bus ministry, Sunday school, foster care. It's probably the Lord putting that burden on your heart to care about them kids for a reason. See, look at your burden. Number four, I'll hurry. Look at your talents. That's what I said a minute ago. Uh, my, your past training and education sometimes is an indication of what God's will for your life will be, what you're equipped to do. I've heard of a man who, who flew airplanes and worked on airplanes and he could fly small planes and small jets. And some of them guys like that, they get saved. And when they get saved, they get in a good soul winning Bible believing church and missionaries come through. I have heard of them 
these guys who take these missionaries and fly them to the Philippines or fly them uh, down to South America, fly them down there in Bolivia and all them places like that or fly them down uh, to, to uh, the Virgin Islands or, or one of them places and fly and see what happened. God equipped them before they ever got saved and then when they got saved, he used that guy as a pilot to further the gospel and take them down there. Now, see how that makes sense? Now, I don't believe the Lord called me to be an airplane pilot. I, I have no desire, don't want to know. I got preacher friends who do. I, I have preacher friends down there in, down here in Georgia, Brother Danny Zorn and them, uh, Cody and them, are, uh, they fly airplanes, and that's great, hallelujah, more power to them. I'd rather have a helicopter. I think I could do better with a helicopter. I, in my revival, just go land right in the parking lot, jump out and preach and go flop back in my, out there in the yard where I live. Uh, but uh, I'll probably never have that, but I have no training or background in that area. I can't go down there and say, well, hey, I I want the blessings of God. I'm going to fly you to Puerto Rico. Hop on. No. God has not given me that talent. Look at your talents. Look at what you're equipped to do. I'm going to say a couple things here uh, that might be a little, little controversial. But, um, but you, you know, uh, I, I don't understand how that they, you, you got a guy that's four foot nine and they say, you get out there and dunk a basketball. Well, he can't. He's not equipped to dunk a basketball. How come the whole world can get that, but in church, we can't get it? I'm not trying to be ugly. I just don't know how to say this, but I have been to churches where people got up and tried to sing. I'm not being ugly, really. And, and I don't think you have to be talented. I've heard people say, I've heard people say, well, I'll tell you one thing, brother. They can't sing good, but the Spirit of God's all over them. Okay, I can live with that. I'll tell you what's bad. When they ain't got no talent or spirit. Man, it's hard to endure. And I don't care if you can carry a tune in the bucket, brother. You get up and do it for the glory of God and tears run down your face. Hallelujah. But you know, I, I don't know how. Uh, oh, Lord. I don't know. I, I, I'm not saying God don't have some people to sing that can't. He probably does. But wouldn't it, wouldn't it dawn on you after a while that nobody ever says, I enjoyed that, or, or the pastor never asks you again? Or, uh, and I'm not talking about our church. I'm not, I wish some of more of y'all would get up here and at least try it. I do. Uh, uh, put all the burden on Brother Jason <laughs> all the time. We need more people that would get up and try to sing. But but you know what I'm talking about. Good night. Uh, I, I, I'm saying it just, phew, Lord, I mean, the, you know what will kill? What if, what if Miss Desi got up here and she said, all right, we're going to sing Victory in Jesus. I heard it all. That runs the Spirit of God out of here. Story, how Savior came from glory. How he, now, you say, Brother Danny, if they're doing it, if they're doing it for the Lord, I ain't got nothing critical to say about it. But your talent, look at your talent. Everybody can't do that. Everybody can't play a piano. Everybody can't uh, uh, sing a song. Uh, I've told Kelly since since the last several years. She's. Uh, I said, you know what your talent? She asked me one time. She said, what's my talent? And I said, you know what your talent is. Your talent is teaching and training and being an example for young girls. And I believe that. It's, she's, she's gifted at that. She can do a lot of stuff. She can cook. She can, uh, she can uh, teach. She can, do, she can sing. Uh, she can sing, really. Uh, but, uh, she, she can, uh, but you know what? She, her gift, her gift is leading all these young girls that are 10, 11, and 12, and 13 just are drawn to her. When we're at camp, they're drawn to her. I mean, you know, she's got all that big mop hair and beautiful hair and all that. And they look at that and they say, wow. And you're the preacher's wife. And she's, she's got a gift. She, she can help those young girls. I'm telling you, I, I, one of my gifts is being able to help you find yours. And that's hers. That's her. That's one of her. I'm telling you, I'm not kidding. I'm telling you, she's got a, she has a talent. I told her, I said, you ought to get you a ministry. And I mean, those girls, young ladies, anywhere from 12 to 30 are just drawn to her like flies. 
I mean, we got them up to the house coming all the time. What do you think, Kelly? What do you think? Calling and stuff like that. Now, find out what you're good at and what you can do. Some of you men, you, you, some of these young boys look at you. You're smart. You're talented. You're educated. You, you can do stuff. You can work on cars. You can uh, build stuff. You can uh, do stuff uh, like, like Todd and him riding them motorcycles. Little kids look at stuff like that. Find out what you can do and do it. Now, let me say something that might be a little controversial. I believe there's a lot of people who ought to be doing stuff that think. I, let me say it like this. When I got saved, there's a bunch of boys got saved. A bunch of guys got saved when I got saved. And not long after that, they started getting called to preach. And in the revival I got saved in, I think there's about 20 guys got called to preach. You know how many of them's preaching tonight? Three, I think. Maybe four. Me, my cousin Joey, and two or three more out of about 20. Now, I'm going to tell you what I think happens. I might be wrong. I'm not God, but I believe when you have a big revival and a bunch of people come in and get saved and a young man gets called to preach, sometimes the Spirit of God starts moving and, and people just get all excited and they just think, man, maybe I believe the Lord wants me to preach. And in good faith, make that step. And the truth is, the Lord never did call them. I'm not saying who's calling who ain't. I'm not making that judgment. I got enough problems trying to figure out my own self most of the time. So I'm not saying, well, I don't believe they're calling, I don't believe that. But I do believe it's obvious, it's obvious that some men have tried, have tried to be in the ministry that God never did want in the ministry. He wanted, like, I'm thinking of a businessman right now. Nobody around here. I'm thinking of a businessman in Texas. He made a lot of money, a lot of money. This man prospered, made a lot of money. He got saved. He started putting money into the ministry, putting out the word of God, put a preacher on a TV program, and then suddenly he decided he's called to preach. And he gave up all that, and all that ministry stopped. And I don't know if he ever did anything much in the ministry or not. Now, I heard his pastor say this. He said he'd have been better off to keep making all that money and funneling it into that ministry and more people would have been saved if he'd have just kept work doing what God gave him to making a lot of money and giving it to missionaries to get people saved. Now, I don't know about all that for sure, but I guarantee you, I guarantee you that there are thousands of people who thought God uh, give me this to do or God give me that to do and never did do it. And I'm not the Lord. I'm not the Lord. I'm not the Lord to call a seven-year-old boy or a seven-year-old man if he wants to. But it's, uh, what's your talent? Look at your talent. Look at your talent. Now one man said, well, he couldn't be called ple- preach because he can't talk plain. Moses couldn't talk plain. So you can't say they're not. Nobody can cite that for sure. So don't you let me discourage you. But I'm telling you, Look at your talent. Look at your talent. Um, number five, look at your present situation. Look at your present situation. It is probably, as I said, not God's will for us to go out there and start a new auditorium this week. Look at our present situation. In the army, everybody listen to me. You're here at Shining Light Baptist Church. God put you in this church. This is your church. You listen to me. You know what God said? It's just like in the army. In the army, what do they say? An order is a what? Order. You don't, when, when, when a sergeant or the lieutenant gives you an order to command your post, when the wind starts blowing or the enemy starts coming, you don't say, well, I think... I think the sergeant would want me to do this or that and throw down your weapons and run. You stay at your appointed post until you get further orders from headquarters. That's good practical advice on knowing the will of God for your life. Look at your present situation. You you stay right where God's put you. Listen, listen to me. As I said a minute ago, if you got... If you got four kids and in debt head over your heels, it probably ain't God's will for you to move to China this week. See, just common sense like that. Be happy doing God's will today. Read your Bible. The harvest is plenteous. The labors are few. 
and stay busy for God right there. Instead of going to work saying, I'm not happy, I gotta go to that old stupid job tomorrow and I'm not in the will of God and I married the wrong person and I'm miserable and all that. Here's what you do. So this is where God has me. I'm gonna witness on my job. I'm gonna be thankful for my family, for my husband, for my wife that God gave me and I'm just gonna be, make the very best out of it. I believe you can be just right smack dab in the middle of the will of God at home making biscuits and taking care of your kids and serving God as somebody uh, giving their testimony in a giant crusade on TV. Amen. Guarantee it, guarantee it. He may just want you to be the best housewife you can possibly be. He may just want you to be the best husband that you can be in your circumstance. You know what David Livingston said? David Livingston said, I'd rather be in the will of God in the heart of Africa than to be on the throne in England out of the will of God. My mom, as you know, You've heard me talk about her. I think about her so much. Here in just a couple of weeks, it'll be, I believe, eight years now. My mom could have, when we was little, said, I have made a mess out of my life. I married a lost man. I ain't got a car. There's snow 16 inches outside. My husband went to work. Don't know when he'll be back. He go to get low. Daddy'd go get a loaf of bread and come back three days later. That's true, when we were little. She had no way to get no food, no way to get nothing. If the power went out, it was just, just freezing. I remember one time, Daddy's going to sell the TV, and I, I was five years old. You say you can't remember nothing. When you, you, I do. I remember laying in the floor and crying because Daddy was going to sell our TV because we watched cartoons on Saturday. And I remember that. And I don't know if you ever did or not, but I do remember laying in the floor and crying about that. I remember one time when I was in the second grade, I had a teacher, and I really, really didn't like my teacher. And my stomach hurt so bad. I wasn't faking, y'all. My stomach was killing me, and I couldn't go to school. And the Lord moved her out. I guess. <laughs> she left the school and got a new teacher, and I was fine after that. They took me to the doctor and everything. Wasn't nothing wrong with me. She was mean, ugly, and mean. Her name was Miss Peak, like Peak, a peak of a mountain. She's been dead 50 years now, so don't, there's no way she'd know this. But I remember mom could have said, man, I've made a mess out of my life. Married a lost guy from West Virginia, and he's crazy. He's drinking. Got kids. Lord, I've made a mess. I'll never amount to nothing I hear. I'll turn the Billy Graham crusade on, and I see... Corey Ten Boom and all these people giving these great testimonies and I'll, I'll never be able to do nothing for you Lord she could have said that but you know what she done she set me on her lap and my two sisters listen to me mamas and she taught us that Bible and she read us Bible stories and she preached us continually and I believe right now tonight that I'm saved because of the influence of my mom I believe there ain't no telling where I'd be right now if it wasn't my mom I'd be in hell or on my way. Don't you think because nobody knows who you are, you're not important. Don't you think you're not in the will of God. My mom, every person that ever got saved at a new manna, every person that ever got saved in revivals, every person that ever got saved here, every person on the internet, mom will share in those rewards. But everything because she put it in my heart to seek God. And you can do the same thing for your kids. You may be in a miserable marriage. You may be in a situation right now where you think, Lord, I don't know how much more of this I can stand. You may be in a situation right now where you say, Lord, I, I've just messed my whole life up. Let me, let me read you a little poem and I'm through. If, if the sun was always shining and the sky was always blue, and the flowers always blooming, and the trees were always with a green hue. If the morning was always cheerful, and the nights all clear and bright, and the birds was always singing, and never needing to take flight, 
we would soon grow tired and weary and off complain and sigh. For we'd miss the lovely rainbow that God put in the sky. Yes, we'd miss the rain and shadow and fleecy clouds of white. We'd miss the stars and the moonlight and the winter's chilling bite. We'd never know the rapture of the first snow of the year or the shout of the happy kids yelling, whoopee, spring is here. If we could all have our wishes come true at our command, it wouldn't be long till we'd want to change things back to the way God He's got you right where he wants you tonight. He's got you right where you want. Quit fighting him. Quit struggling. Quit trying to say, if I could change this, I could be happy. If I could do, get out of this mess, I could. just say, God, this is where you've got me. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to witness. I'm right where I need to be, and I'm going to make the best and serve God. Let's stand by our head for prayer. Come on, Miss Desi. She's playing tonight. Maybe, maybe you're struggling tonight with the will of God. Or maybe you just need to surrender tonight. She's playing softly. Just slip out of your seat and get down here on this altar and say, all right, Lord, I'm happy with it. Whatever you say. Whatever you say, Lord. I'm willing to accept it. It may be that God's got you right where He wants you. And you just keep fighting it, keep fighting it, keep fighting it. And you better off just surrendering. Say, all right, Lord, I'll just surrender. If you want to put me somewhere else, you put me somewhere. If you want to send me to Asia to be a missionary, you do it. But Lord, until you do, I'm just going to stay right here and fight this battle and serve you. Amen. Amen. Others, 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 others. We'll take just a few seconds and pray. We'll wait just a few seconds and pray. Amen. 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 Just be willing to accept right where you are. Ain't no use kicking and screaming. Ain't no use kicking and screaming. Just, uh, just say, Lord, thy will be done. Like Jesus, not my will, but thine be done. Hallelujah. 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 Dear Lord God, I pray in Jesus' name that you bless every person here tonight. Lord, I, I, I want to be in your will, Lord. As far as I know, I am. And Lord, anywhere I'm not, show me where I'm not. And let me be willing. Make me willing to be willing, Lord. Make me willing to be willing to be in your will. Lord God, please, I pray for those that are all messed up tonight, those that are backslid out there tonight trying to do their will instead of yours. I pray you'd get a hold of their heart, convict them, bring them back where they need to be. I pray, God, in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, come down upon us, lead us, guide us, and direct us. Fill us with the power of God. Bless our church. Cause it to go and grow and prosper for the glory of God. Do what ought to be done in our lives tonight. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the will of God. Lord, I'm so thankful, Lord. You're not trying to play hide and go seek from us, Lord. I know you want us to know your will and be in your will. Lord, I want to do your will. And I pray you'd help us to do it. Help us to get the job done you've given us to do right here at Shining Light Baptist Church. God, give us a burden. Help us to go out of here determined this week to get the job done for you. Meet with us Saturday morning. Lord, help us to go knock on some doors and get some people saved while we got a change, Lord. Bless our bus workers. Encourage everybody at work this week. Bless all the kids at school this week. Watch over them, God, I pray. Well, thank you for what you do. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.